so here's here's the three D rendering debug display, and and this is very much research debug display. So it's not meant to be like you know we're not doing all the cleanup that we need to do, and uh, and it does slow the system down. But I, the, besides display, though, I, a lot of our our uh, computation cost is in the the number of features that we are are searching for. So. So in each each frame, this is a one megapixel frame, and so we're we're finding these features, describing them. We're doing this at multiple scales, okay. and then you know we're matching against a database of uh, five hundred to five hundred thousand okay. plus. Yeah. Sorry, so, now I see what time's going. Yeah, so you know, uh, but this stuff is pretty easily paralyzable, and and. And yeah, but this will be connected to the robot. See the coordinate systems. Well, you can see them there. <clears throat> it tells where the object is so that the robot hand can grasp it. So once this is a no, mounted in a known place on the robot, you can yeah. put it into the it robot centric it. coordinate system. <laughs> and it will know where to grab that object. It, it will actually have a 3D model of the. So we actually created 3D models of all these things. That's part of the training process when we spin around this table. Yeah, let, let me run that right now. So is it actually creating so sort of a, an equivalent of a scene database if you were rendering but, I mean, 3D? And so you're actually working backwards to create the... Well, when we collect, we also create a 3D model. So, you know, this is collected by spinning this around. <laughs> Yeah. And it's using these calibration patterns to know where all the points are. <laughs> and by the time it's done, it's formed a 3D model. So it knows where all the vertices are and it knows what gets texture mapped for each of those surfaces. And well, we're not okay. at the texture map. Okay. Yet, <laughs> we, have a, we have crude texture maps that need to be improved, but, but those textured, uh, what, that, that 3D object will plug into what we call the grasping pipeline. And so if it knows a 3D model of an object, then it searches using a simulator the best grasp of this object. Things we're done. Well, it seems to really be taking off. And what I've noticed is a lot of companies are deploying it in products. Have you seen any high volume products uh, chip with OpenCV? Do you see? Uh, I don't know about high volume in particular. I mean, it's we've had three and a half million downloads. I know it's used in swimming pool drowning detection, mine <laughs> monitoring, nice. and and uh, just on and on. I've had, uh, I, you know, because I don't have any requirement that you report to me what you're doing. I, I just had a company writing like, "Oh, you're not responding to my bugs. We're we're shipping this product and." He wanted a very particular thing on a particular architecture. I go, well, that's, you know, okay, so we'll answer you. But it wasn't, he had an uncommon need, but it was something for an ARM architecture. So, you know, we're developing apps and actually probably a standard for, you know, Android. So that'll right. be a, and so we have, we have apps that are, that we have panoramic stitching that works in the street view, street view data structure. Hopefully that'll come out and be enabled so that well, you, you can just add to Google Street View using Android. But we have many other things. That, you know, I have camera-based interfaces so that you can move the phone around as if you're looking at a bigger document. Uh, a lot of camera utilities so that the you know, somewhat cheap camera here can produce higher quality images using a lot of these techniques. And so, We'll be doing, and, and also tracking 3D and recognizing uh, barcodes and, and where this is, and, and recognizing images, which hopefully we'll show you later, um, uh, recognizing objects. So, so uh, you know, that would be a high volume. And, and of course, uh, you know, the point of the summer is, is to do the same thing for the iPhone, so that there'll be an easy way for people to get vision on, on on the iPhone. So, you know, with Google, we might put out some sort of demo apps that are meant to be snipped and you put your stuff in there, but it shows you how to get up and running. Well, your reference to the customer complaining about needing a bug fix right away, that's probably the whole dilemma of deploying open source in a, in a consumer product or a high volume product because 
you don't have people working for you that can go fix bugs. You're dependent on the open source. Well, I mean, we do have this. I mean, when people come to me for consulting because I don't, I'm too busy. We have the same contracting group, which is called ITSEs. I often point them there. There's probably other people that can do consulting, but they, you know, Nvidia and and other companies that want uh, that want this. Uh, kind of work. There is, there are contractors around, and there's a user group of now it's 45,000 people, many of whom are you know capable of development. So things can be posted there. So or, it may evolve just like Linux did, right? As to all these other variants. Yeah. So uh, so I mean, there there are people, and you know, I work with this particular contracting group, and you know, which can do specific jobs and and, and optimize for this architecture or that or. Well, would you suggest that OpenCV is a good starting point for somebody that's new to computer vision? I think it's uh, among the better <laughs> starting <laughs> okay. points. So, I mean, agree. this book is, is uh, has been a bestseller in computer vision and machine learning because that's yes. a part of OpenCV uh, for three years, which is um, uh, sort of amazing or a testament to how badly books are written in this. Well, we, we joke about the... <laughs> and it doesn't make you rich, unfortunately, either. Well, but the, it's a, one of the whole, the entire premise really behind the Embedded Vision Alliance is that there's this gap between people that build embedded systems and the information that's out there in academia, and all, the, all these algorithms that have been done in either governments or universities. And if you want to start learning about in computer vision, you you have to start with a textbook, and then you're right. going quickly into the multivariable calculus. So we went back and forth on thinking, you know, should it be another textbook? And so we we decided we'd fill this gap as sort of an adjunct te textbook and a popular book for hobbyists, and sort of the things you really wanted to know when you're first starting graduate school or whatever. Right. And it's turned out it's been used as a textbook, as a primary text a lot. Yeah. So. Uh, that wasn't the intent, but because the you know the math isn't formal such as there is, the, it, it's more like trying to give intuitions of the algorithm, and that's what when I was a student I really liked. Uh, I, I can't can't learn things until I get the intuition, and then the math starts making sense and whatever. I can't just do it. The, I, I don't do well starting from theory, so I wrote a book uh, in that way. But well, certainly gratifying to start with something where you can actually quickly see your result, and once you've got you know, video, and then you can start doing filtering. It's a, it's a really good way to learn just by starting with that. Right. So I guess my, uh, probably should get to our last question, and that's, what's next? Where, where do you see the future of OpenCV? So, well, version two of that book. <laughs> so, I mean, so, open, book so we've open. already, you know, the, that that's the C interface, and it's okay. still valid and, yeah. and probably always will be. But we've now been developing C++ and modern structures, and it, you know, it now works seamlessly with, with the standard template library and boost structures. And, and now we're going, what, what we're seeing basically is a lot of people, so there's hobbyists and grad students and whatever who like to develop at this low level, they want pixel access. There's this whole probably much larger group that wants to just be enabled at a higher level. So they want to do you know, face tracking and, and they want higher level tools. So that's, that's basically you know, in a short term, <laughs> short summary of where we're going. We're adding higher level functionality. And one of the ways we're doing this, uh, I also like, you know, I like MATLAB, though it's a very specialized, expensive development environment. We wanted to get to that, that speed of development. That's why MATLAB is like the dominant thing used in schools, because development time to paper published is the fastest. I'd like to get to that stage with OpenCV. And so we're working on, this is all new work, it's not published anywhere <laughs> yet, but uh, a basic way uh, from a simple Python script where you would have, uh, you'd be able to put object recognition or different kinds of architectures together. You'd be able to interact with it graphically at any time, just open up variables and change them as you're developing and adjusting stuff. And then, and then when you're done, it would just print to a C++ loop. So the whole thing would be in C++. And that's, oh, that sounds great. So that's what is being actively worked on. But it's those kinds of things. So that would be this higher level. And also, that thing would, it, it could stand alone, but we're also going to allow something where if you want to be a ROS, the Robot Operating System node, you'll just say, I want to be a node. And, and you'll plug into this distributed robotic system that's being developed. 
or it can just stand alone. So, so you know, that's, that's one of the things. Then I'm working on all kinds of higher level functionality. So I'm, I'm sponsoring or working with NIST, the National Institute of Standard, on this Solutions and Perception Challenge where we're it's trying a contest to... contest next month, you mentioned. It's that. a contest, but it, it, there's been many vision contests. This one differs in that it's actually trying to establish solve problems. So, so we hope the person who wins, I have this exponential scale, if you win at like 80%, you get something like three bucks. And then, and then another percent, you get six. And it goes up to you know, 10,000. And hopefully we'll raise the prize. But uh, you know, at, at basically at 100%, you'll get, you'll get this full prize money because that last effort it's is really hard. exponential <laughs> yeah. harder. But we want, actually want to get people to, the, to solve problems. So this, we're dealing with textured objects such as that book. Yeah. <laughs> it's in the data set. Yeah, and, it, yeah. and, and so those can be recognized. And then we're moving on already onto other items that don't have textures, like this you know, doesn't have much texture. It's mostly defined by shape. So that's already, we have stuff that's far along in that. And then flexible objects and transparent. And so we're making approaches to all these things and you know, using things like the Connect and things that are following after that ha give you um, 2D and 3D data. So we're making use of that. And, and again, just uh, also organizing this in higher level chunks. So you're keeping busy. But, you know, there's only a few people, relatively few, know what to do with Kalman filters and point trackers. But uh, there's a far larger group that can deal with. Okay, here's a 3D face. It's location <laughs> in space. Uh, you know, that's open to a lot more developers than that lower level stuff. But, but you're, I want to give you a last plug for your book. But the one you're talking about, 2.0, is is strictly a revision of this book? It doesn't talk about these higher level? No, it will, it, okay. it will expand. All the higher level stuff, the new functionality is being done in C++ with a Python interface. So now the whole library has a Python interface. And the way we scripted it, it actually makes it now easy for us to plug in new interfaces. These aren't auto-generated interface. There's a script where we can tune the interface to be like, say, the developers of Python expect to see. We've gotten much closer to that, and, and that will be, we'll probably do the same thing in Java. But, but so the new book will, will contain a lot of new material and a lot of the same material in C++, but this book stays valid. Those routines are still callable in the same way. Okay. And, and so we're keeping that So you interface. got a date for us for this 2.0? <sighs> is it going to be this year? <laughs> the hope is to finish it this year. It's sort of like when you add up the time and when we're going to yeah. do this, it, you know, I, it's always this coming year. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, we really hope to do it. And, and uh, I'm gonna, we, I've been talking back and forth with Adrian about let's, you know, when do we just you know, get each other to start doing it. Uh, well, I really appreciate all your time. I'd give another plug for your book. That uh, I bought this on Amazon, so I'd encourage anybody who is getting into computer vision, this is an excellent book to start with. You can very quickly get some sample code running and start doing your own computer vision. So I'd like to encourage everybody in the Embedded Vision community to go to embeddedvision.com, embedded-vision.com, and give us some feedback. Join the conversation there and tell us if you want to hear more of these discussions. Maybe we can get some more of Gary's time to talk about uh, you know what he's doing next year. Okay, thank you very much.